This afternoon's session will be on human reproduction. Right, now human reproduction by now, we all know will be part of our paper one, end of the year. And by now you should know grade 12, so that our paper one will be written on Friday the 18th of November. So human reproduction is a topic in paper one. It usually takes about three weeks and depending on what sequence of topics your teacher is following at your school, it could either be done in term one or in term two. So you should have, whether you've done it in term one or in term two, you should have completed the topic on human reproduction. And as you can see, the reason why I chose this topic from paper one, it's that it has quite a heavy weighting in paper one. 28% of your paper one is on human reproduction, meaning 41 marks. And this is marks that you can easily score in your paper one. So please pay attention. Make sure you know your work. Right. If I go to, let's just continue. What are the key concepts in human reproduction that I must know? Now, remember in previous sessions, I didn't put it on up on this um, PowerPoint, but your exam guideline guides you exactly as to what can be examined in your topic on human reproduction. And if we look here, let me just get a pen or a highlighter, or I'll just get a pointer. Human reproduction, the first thing that you need to understand in human reproduction is structure. So make sure you know the structure of the male reproductive system. Make sure you know the structure and functions of the female reproductive system. They could all either give you a simplified diagram, labels and functions, and then more higher order questions. What do I also need to know apart from the male and female reproductive system? I need, need to know what puberty is and what are the characteristics in humans, uh, sorry, in males and females when, when puberty starts. I need to understand gametogenesis, gamete, gametes, genesis, the beginning of gametes, in males, spermatogenesis, in females, oogenesis. I need to understand the menstrual cycle. And please, when we speak of the menstrual cycle, it is not just menstruation. Menstrual cycle talks about the cyclic changes in the woman's body that takes place in the ovary as well as in the uterus under hormonal control. Then we're going to look at fertilization, what happens during fertilization and how your zygote develops up until a blastocyst. And the last part of human reproduction, here we look at implantation, what gestation is and the functions of the placenta. So let's get right into our very first part. As mentioned in our exam guidelines, you need to know the male reproductive system, structure, and functions. Right, so we will go through each one of these structures. Now, remember, they don't have to give you this diagram. They can just give you a part of a diagram. Right, let's start with the male reproductive organs, which are normally outside the male's body, and we'll speak to that later on. So that is the testes. And the testes has two functions. By now we know it produces sperm cells and also the hormone testosterone. And this is where meiosis, remember when we did the chapter on cell division, meiosis is for gamete formation. If they asked you the site in the male reproductive system where meiosis takes place, it is in the testes to produce your haploid male gametes called your sperm cells. So just from that mouthful, there's quite a number of facts that you must know. Testes, meiosis takes place to produce sperm cells, your gametes, right? And it also produces the male hormone called testosterone. Right, then we will see the 
The testis is normally outside the male's body and it's surrounded by a sac-like structure. And this sac-like structure is referred to as a scrotum. It's a skin sac. And what's the function of the scrotum? Two functions. It protects the testis, right, from damage and it holds the testis outside the body at a temperature below human body temperature. So two, that is two degrees below that. And this is the best temperature for the production of sperm. By now we know the normal body temperature is 36.9, or we could say 37 degrees. That is too high for sperm production. So the testes is outside the body so that the scrotum can actually keep the testes at two degrees lower for optimum sperm production. And be very careful with this because normally they give it as a higher order question. They could ask you in past papers, why must males not wear tight underwear or sit too long or very hot baths? Are you with me? And that is for optimum sperm production so that they can be fertile. Because if there's no optimum sperm production, you could either have no sperm or abnormal sperm being formed, and that can influence the fertility of the male. Right, now the sperm is produced, the sperm cells are produced. It is then transferred to the epididymis. So epididymis is a coiled structure lying here on top of the testes. And what is the function of the epididymis? Here is where sperm is stored, and for the maturation of sperm. So sperm cells mature and are stored in the epididymis. And it is like a, it's indicated with the quail-like structure there. Right. Now, once sperm is needed, there is a little duct. And there I'm just going to go with the duct. You find the duct. This duct actually com um, combines the testes. Two, if you go straight with that duct, there you can see is the urethra. Remember in grade 11, the urethra is the tube through which urine and sperm or semen is excreted. So joining that is the vas deferens or the sperm duct. Both of them can be used. Okay, and what's the function of the sperm duct or the vas deferens? It transports sperm. Now, here we talk about sperm because it's the sperm cells from the epididymis to the urethra. So what would happen if I cut through that sperm, that vas deferens or that sperm duct? Meaning the seminal fluid that is secreted by the, by the male will have no sperm, meaning no fertilization and it will be infertile. Remember, that can be a consequence of human reproduction if the vas deferens is tied or cut. Right, so that is still my sperm moving through there. And as my sperm moves through the vas deferens, remember the sperm has all these mitochondria and it has a tail so that it can swim. You will notice there are three glands. Now, there's one gland that doesn't have a pair, and that is the prostate gland. It's usually, if you look, that would be your bladder. Just below your bladder, you will have this one gland called the prostate gland. And what's the function of the prostate gland? It produces an alkaline fluid. And what does, remember in grade nine, you can, a fluid can either be acidic or alkaline. So this alkaline fluid neutralizes the acids in the vagina because the vagina protects itself and it has an acidic medium that could kill the sperm. So part of this prostate gland is producing a fluid. So now the sperm becomes very mobile. It's in this fluid. Then I have some paired glands called the seminal vesicles. It normally looks like a little leaf structure because many a times learners have difficulty 
uh, distinguishing between the seminal vesicle and the cowper's gland. Seminal vesicle has got like a leaf-like structure, and there will be two of them as well. It's a gland that produces nutrient-rich fluid, because remember these sperm cells, millions are secreted so that they can have energy to swim. Then we have the little cowper's gland here, just below the prostrate gland. So as it is moving through, there you can see the seminal vesicle would put fluid in, the prostate gland would add fluid, and the cowper's gland would add fluid. And all this fluid, the seminal fluid, plus the sperm produced in the testes, now constitutes semen. Very important grade 12. Semen is made up of seminal fluid plus sperm. So if the, if the vas deferens is cut, you can still ejaculate seminal fluid. Sorry, semen, but it will only consist of seminal fluid and no sperm. Right, so there we've covered the male reproductive system. It's very important at this stage that you should close the labels, look at past diagrams, make sure you know structure as well as function. Then I've given you here on the side the two functions of the hormone testosterone. Remember, it's a male hormone and it has two functions. The first function it is for the development of secondary sexual characteristics. When we do puberty, testosterone will be secreted once your body goes into those changes in the male body that would lead to puberty, like your pubic hair, your deep voice, your muscular body. And also testosterone helps with the maturation of sperm cells. Very important, you don't need to know the individual cells in the testes like the Leydig cells and the Sertoli cells. You just need to know the structure in the male reproductive system that produces sperm cells is the testes. Structure in the male reproductive system that produces the hormone testosterone, the testes. The sac-like structure that encloses and protects the testes and keeps the temperature at two degrees lower than body temperature, that would be your scrotum. The duct that transports sperm from the testes to the urethra, my vas deferens or my sperm duct. And then I have the urethra, very important. If you find the penis, it's easy to find. It is the duct inside the penis that you transport both urine as well as semen. Remember, what is semen made up of? Seminal fluid plus sperm cells. Right, and that would be your male reproductive system. Right, let's see if we've learned anything. This comes from a past paper. The diagram below shows the part of the male reproductive system. So now where should you even think of ovaries or oviducts or fallopian tubes? And if I can give you a tip, like I've done in previous tutoring sessions, as soon as you have a diagram, let me just get my pen here, you first underline what is given. So it's the male reproductive system. Then you put in all your labels. That would be your, we just added now, your seminal vesicle. Remember, if you could get confused with the glands, that's my bladder. Below my bladder would be my prostate gland so b would be my prostate gland then that would be my little cowper's gland but it doesn't have a label so they probably not ask us anything about that c there i can see if i don't know which duct is and i follow it back i can see it comes from the testes and it goes there so c is either my vas deferens or my sperm duct d lying on top of my testes, so D must be my epididymis, E, my testes, F, my scrotum, G, my urethra, and H, my penis. Now, once I've identified that, that should take me a minute. Now I go to the questions. Identify part C. Now I can see, see, 
I already have the, the label on my question paper. So you're either going to write, write fast deference or sperm duck. Both are accepted. If it's there, scrotum, H is my penis. Give the, and very important, they want the letter and name. Please, grade 12s, if you get a question, give the letter and name. Give both. Give the letter and name of the part that stores sperm temporarily. And remember, what did we say earlier on? Sperm is stored in the epididymis. So if I know that information, my letter is going to be D. Because I get a mark for D and I get a D, uh, mark for epididymis. Transport both semen and urine. I've done it earlier. I know it's the urethra. So I know it is G, urethra. Produces testosterone. That I know is my testes, so it's E. And then they asked me, give the letters of two parts that contribute to the formation of semen. Now, remember, what did I say? What is semen? Semen is made up of sperm cells plus seminal fluid. So which letter produces sperm cells? It is E. And the seminal fluid can either come from B or A. So it could be E, B, or A. Okay. Let's just see if we're correct on this. I hope you guys got this one correct. I just want to, apologies for that. And let's go to our answer. And there we can see. There we have our correct answer according to the memo. Very important. They accept both vas deferens and sperm duct, the scrotum, the penis, and there you can see the letter and name is marked independently. And here, two parts. Remember, it could be A because A contributes seminal fluid to the semen. B contributes seminal fluid to the semen. And E contributes sperm cells to the semen so any two of those three right i hope at this stage any question on the male reproductive system will be answered with confidence right according to our exam guideline our next topic is the female reproductive system now once again with the female reproductive system please ensure that you know the structure and functions right i always go and i try and identify the ovaries because the ovaries are to the female that the testes are to the male so what happens in the ovary they produce ova which is my egg cells and they secrete hormones progesterone and estrogen just remember so they are basically Two functions of the ovaries. It produces the ova through the process of oogenesis or through the type of cell division meiosis, and it produces the hormones progesterone and estrogen. We'll come to that later. So once my egg cells are produced, later on we will learn it is released from the ovary into this is my fallopian tube, and I've got two ovaries, and therefore I will have two fallopian tubes by the process of ovulation. Now, remember, every month only one egg cell is released. So if it's released from this ovary, then you will have an egg cell waiting here to be fertilized. So the fallopian tube, it basically transports the ova from the ovary to the uterus, or it is the site of fertilization, meaning if sperm cells are released, this is where fertilization should take place. Right, so that would be my fallopian tube. It connects the ovaries. Now, remember, that is just a structural function, connects the ovaries to the uterus. But what is the function? It transports the ova from the ovary. They do not accept if they ask you, give a function, let's say this is A, of A. 
You cannot write, it connects the ovaries to the uterus. That's part of the structure. But what is its function by connecting it? It transports the ova from the ovary. And it is where fertilization takes place. Right. Then I have my uterus. Very important. This is my uterus. And by now we know the inner wall. I only need to know the name of the inner wall because it is a very vascular wall called the endometrium. It's the inner lining of the uterus. And this is where implantation will take place if fertilization took place. Right. Then, now this is where learners also get confused. The opening of the uterus here is referred to as the cervix. Cervix is the lower narrow part of the uterus. Remember, this is not a function. It's just telling you about the structure. So what is the function? It stretches during childbirth. Why? To allow the baby through. So it helps with the birthing process. Then I have the vagina, which is this canal here. And what does the vagina do? First of all, it receives the penis and semen during sexual intercourse. So during copulation, when the sperm is transferred to the female, it is deposited. It receives the um, semen in the vagina. Also, it has a second function. It is the passage through which the baby is born. So it also serves as a birth canal. And later on, we'll see it also helps with menstruation where the blood is shed through. Then very important. So I've done all the females. Oh, the uterus, remember, carries the embryo and fetus during pregnancy. So let's have a look at how they could ask this. Remember grade 12s, I always tell you, do not look at the questions first. Read what is given. The structure below, let me get my pen again, represents, re, the female reproductive system. So I first go, I identify my ovaries. So I know now B is my ovaries, right? This would be my fallopian tubes. And then this part C would be my uterus. And the opening year of the uterus is not my vagina. The opening is my cervix. Right, now I've identified the parts. Now go look at what is being asked. Identify part D. Now it's very easy because I know what part D is. Part D is the cervix. State one function. You must just state a function of part A. But now I know the fallopian tube. I cannot say connect the ovary to the uterus. That's not a function. That's part of the structure. By connecting it, what does it do? It transports the egg cell or the ovum to the uterus for implantation. Or it is the site of fertilization. Any one of those. Now describe the process of oogenesis. Now just remember, I just want to get rid of these um, annotations here. Oh, come on. Right. So we've done part D. You must be able to load. And please hear once again, grade 12s, make sure you know the difference between the cervix, which is there, the opening of the uterus. Make sure you know that this is the vagina. So many learners wrote that that is the vagina. This canal is the vagina, the birth canal. And the vulva are these openings of the vagina. Right. So make sure so your answer is cervix and not vagina or vulva. One, then we go on to our next one. State one function of part A. We've already said first you need to identify what A is. And we've identified it because we wrote all our labels on our diagram. And there you can see 
transfers the ovum to the uterus or you could say the embryo because remember as soon as fertilization takes place and you've got your zygote you've got your zygote develops into your marula and that is your embryo so you can say it transfers the embryo and it is where fertilization takes place or you could just say site of fertilization Describe the process of oogenesis. Now, very important. We'll get to oogenesis. But the answer to this question is stated as in the exam guideline. Oogenesis, spermatogenesis, you study from your exam guideline, from no other textbook. First, what is the hormone in, in, involved? It's oogenesis, so under the influence of FSH. Diploid cells undergo mitosis to form follicles. We'll get to this now later on. So I'm not going to spend a lot of um, time on this process because we are doing gametogenesis later on. Now here's a, a higher order question. They've now asked you structure. They've asked you function. They've asked you to describe a process. Now they're looking, can these learners think? A person undergoes a surgical operation to remove part B on both sides. Now, if I wrote here on my diagram that that's my ovary. So if the ovaries are produced, what is the function of the ovaries? It produces um, ova. Explain why this person will not menstruate. Right. So it produces your ova. And it also produces your hormones, estrogen and progesterone. So why will it not menstruate? What is menstruation? It's the shedding of the lining of the endometrium, meaning the endometrium cannot thicken. That is the crutch of the question. Let me just go here quickly. Why would it? There. First, identify C. It is a, sorry, 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 that was a different question. I'm um, by three to five. It secretes estrogen. So estrogen will not be secreted, meaning the endometrium will not thicken and you will not be able to menstruate. So you can see there's your question. No follicle will develop. No estrogen is produced. No progesterone is produced. Therefore, the endometrium will not develop. So if I must work backwards, why will the endometrium not develop? Because there's no follicle. Remember, there's no follicle. There's no estrogen. If there's no follicle, there's no estrogen. If there's no estrogen, there will be no progesterone. Right. Then we get to our next part on our exam guideline, which is puberty. Now, you must know what puberty is. When we say they are in the puberty stage, it's a stage in humans when sexual maturity is reached, either in males or in females, right? And there we can see, let's do the female because she's on the left-hand side. So in females, I should have just switched this. It is stimulated by which hormone? Estrogen. So once the body starts secreting estrogen, you have the growth of the female sex organs. And this have a start of a menstrual cycle and the production of ova. You have growth of pubic hair, growth, and, and remember, you can't say breasts. You don't get breasts. We are born with breasts. It's the development, the growth, and the development of breasts. So these are the characteristics that characterize puberty in females. And there's just a diagram to make it easy. And if we look at the characteristics in males that identify puberty, facial hair or beard, their voice becomes deeper, growth of armpit hair, growth of pubic hair, penis and testes enlarged. So any of those characteristics are an indication of puberty and males and females. Very important in males, it is stimulated by testosterone. In females, it is stimulated by 
estrogen. Right, then we get to the topic of gametogenesis. Gamete, referring to the gametes, the sperm in males and the over in females, genesis formation of gametes. So if they ask you, the process by which gametes is formed through meiosis, you cannot write spermatogenesis or oogenesis. They're asking you generic. The process by which gametes are formed is gametogenesis. But when we refer to males, it has a specific name. So gamete formation in males is referred to as spermatogenesis, the formation of sperm. Right. So spermatogenesis just means formation of sperm or the formation of male gametes. So if you're asking 1.2, the process by which gametes are formed in males, your answer will be spermatogenesis. The process by which gametes are formed in females, your answer will be oogenesis. Then you go to the hormones. What's the hormones that influence them? In males, spermatogenesis is influenced under the influence of testosterone. And remember, your testes secrete testosterone. What happens? Diploid cells in the seminiferous tubules undergo my osis. That's all you need to know. So it's under the influence. There's your first mark of testosterone. Diploid cells in the seminiferous tubules undergo meiosis, and the fourth mark is to form haploid. Very important, not just for the formation of sperm cells, but to form, sorry, to form haploid sperm cells. Those four pointers are very, very important. So under the influence of testosterone, diploid cells in the seminiferous tubules undergo meiosis to form haploid sperm cells. Let's look at oogenesis. O the, the first one here is not part of the process. It is what is the process? What is spermatogenesis? The formation of male gametes. What is oogenesis? The formation of female gametes. And here, what's the hormone involved? The influence of FSH here, Diploid cells in the ovary first undergoes mitosis. Now, if cells undergo mitosis, what forms? A number of follicles are formed or numerous follicles are formed. And then what happens every month? Only one cell inside the follicle enlarges and undergoes meiosis. You don't need to know spermatogonium, all those names. You just say one cell in the follicle enlarges and undergoes meiosis. And then this is very important. Four cells are produced, but only one survives to form a mature haploid ovum. So if you're asking the exam, the product of oogenesis, is it to form four haploid gametes or one haploid gamete? It's one mature haploid ovum because the other three degenerate or they um, do not survive. And that, please make sure this table is very important because it tells me what gametogenesis is. It tells me what spermatogenesis is, how it takes place, what oogenesis is, and how it takes place. And remember, where will spermatogenesis take place in the male? Inside the testes. Where will oogenesis take place inside the female? Inside the ovary. Very, very important. Right. Also, what we need to know is the structure of it. So now we form these sperm cells, but what does the sperm cell actually look like? The sperm cell has three distinct parts. It has a head. It has a neck or a middle section. Please do not, I do not like the word body. Just a neck or a middle section. And it has a long tail. Those are the three main parts of a sperm cell. Let's go to the head and analyze it further. If we look in the head, 
Yeah, in front in the sperm's head is a structure that has digestive enzymes. Now, from grade 11, we know digestive means it breaks it up. So, and that structure is referred to as a acrosome. And what does the acrosome do? It has enzymes to digest the wall of the egg cell for fertilization. So if the acrosome is not there, the sperm cell cannot penetrate the egg cell. So as the sperm cell gets to the egg cell, this acrosome will secrete these um, digestive enzymes that actually breaks up the wall of the ovum, makes a little hole so that the sperm cell can penetrate. And it's not the whole sperm cell that penetrate, this part, the most important part, the nucleus penetrates the egg cell. Then in the head, I also have a nucleus. And the nucleus, I, by now you should know, contains the DNA. So it would have 23 chromosomes, meaning it has the genetic material of the male. Then in the neck part or the middle section, you will notice there's quite a lot of mitochondria. Remember back to grade 10 when we did cell structure. What is the main function of mitochondria? It provides energy, right? So why does the sperm cell need energy? Because the sperm cell is one of the smallest cells in the male body. And it needs to swim the whole N1 up the vagina canal, through the cervix, up the uterus. And then it needs to decide, must I go left fallopian tube or right fallopian tube? So it needs all this energy to swim. And that energy is provided by the mitochondria. And then I ha obviously have a long tail and the tail is there for swimming. So once I know, they could actually ask you to draw a structure of a sperm cell with labels. They could give you a sperm cell and they could ask you the different labels. They could also ask you the suitability. How is the sperm cell suitable for its function? What does the acrosome do? It, it, it has an acrosome to digest through the egg wall. It has a nucleus that contains the genetic material. But here you must be very careful and make sure, grade 12s, that you read the question correctly. Because they could ask you, how is the sperm cell adapted for movement? How is it adapted for movement? It has two things that helps it with movement. Lots of mitochondria for energy for swimming and a long tail that is used for swimming, okay? The nucleus here and the acrosome has got nothing to do with the movement. So be very careful of how the question is phrased. They have mentioned on the right, be advised that when asked for the structural suitability, meaning how is its structure suitable, two marks are generally allocated to each adaptation of the sperm. One mark for the part or the structure and the second mark for the role it plays as in the answer below. So if they just ask you, explain how the sperm cell is structurally suited for its function. Let's just say that it has an acrosome, one mark. What's the function? Why does it have an acrosome? It has enzymes to dissolve a part in the ovum or to break through the egg wall. It has a tail. Why? Enable swim so that it can swim. It has many mitochondria. Why? To provide energy. Right. So now we know how this could be an explained question. But if they ask you, State two ways in which the sperm cell is suited for its function. Just state or name. You can say it's got an acrosome, it's got a nucleus, it's got lots of mitochondria, and it has a long tail. Explain how it is, meaning give a reason why. Why does it have an acrosome? Why does it have a nucleus? Why does it have mitochondria? Why does it have a Tell. You must give the reason why. Let's just get rid of the annotations. 
something that's very neglected in textbooks is the structure of an ovum, an egg cell. Now, if I look at my egg cell, my egg cell basically is any other cell. So in any cell, you will have a nucleus. What do the nucleus of the egg cell contain? Obviously, the genetic material. How many chromosomes? 23. The nucleus is surrounded by cytoplasm and very important, not cytosol. Remember, there's a different cytoplasm is the liquid part of a cell that contains the organelles. The cytosol is just the liquid part without the organelles. So the reason why they accept cytosol in the exam is because we don't show the organelles here. So that is why that is a, a concession that is given. So it's got the cytoplasm. There you have your cytoplasm. Then obviously... On the outside of your cytoplasm, you would have your cell membrane. That is a yellow part would be your cell membrane. And then it is surrounded with a jelly layer for protection. Right. And then these cells would be the follicular cells or the follicle cells, but they're not important now. Only three parts that you need to know in an ovum or an egg cell is the nucleus, contains the genetic material, 23 chromosomes. It has a cytoplasm that helps with the nourishment of the egg cell. And it has a cell membrane, not indicated here, that surrounds it and a layer of jelly that is for protection of the ovum. And their structure, layer of jelly, function, cytoplasm, and the haploid nucleus. At this stage, grade 12, I want, it feels like I'm going through the speed of light. Are there any questions on the gender before we get to the menstrual cycle? Is there any questions on the structure and function? What is happening here? I don't know why. Okay. Let's do one question and before we take any questions, this also comes from a past exam paper. So once again, what is given to me? They're giving me the ovum. So I should know what Ms. Fortain say now. That is the nucleus, but they're not asking me the nucleus. They're asking me the inside part. So that is my cytoplasm and that would be my jelly layer. Yes, my sperm cell. The front part I know is my acrosome, my nucleus, my uh, mitochondria, and my tail. So you fill in all your labels. Identify part A, and then you can just write it directly from there, your jelly layer, B, your cytoplasm, and C, your acrosome. Name the process involving meiosis that leads to the formation of an ovum. Which process is for the formation of egg cells? Eugenesis. Write down only the letter of the part of the sperm that enters the ovum. The only part, remember, the acrosome breaks the wall and then the nucleus would actually penetrate and fuse with that nucleus to form a zygote. So my answer is D. Write down only the letters of two parts, then enable the sperm to move. Two parts for movement. Remember, the head has got nothing there to do with movement. It's E, the midsection, the mitochondria, and F. And there's my answer. And remember what I said, jelly layer is more than enough. Right, before we get to the menstrual cycle, can I just ask at this stage, is there any questions, grade 12, on structure and function? I think it's the easiest part of human reproduction. Okay, then we go to the menstrual cycle. Now, very, very important because a lot of grade 12s make the mistake. They think if we say the menstrual cycle, we are referring to menstruation. Menstruation is but a small part of the menstrual cycle. Menstrual cycle just refers to all the events 
taking place in the ovaries of the female, the ovarian cycle, and the uterus of the female, the uterine cycle. And usually it is about 28 days. So what happens in the ovaries and what happens in the uterus? That is referred to as the menstrual cycle. Right. So what are the hormones involved in the menstrual cycle? Now, at this stage, you must know, just below the brain, you have the pituitary gland, also referred to as the hypophysis. I don't know, for some reason, I prefer, it's easier on the tongue, hypophysis. Easier on the tongue and easier to spell. So you can use the hypophysis. What hormone does the hypothesis secrete? FSH. Now, if you know what the, you can use the abbreviation FSH, but if you know what the abbreviation stands for, follicle stimulating hormone. Now, I just want to go back one slide. Here's my ovaries. In my ovaries, I have what I call these germinal epithelium cells. Remember just now what oogenesis we said? Under the influence of FSH, so you will have these tiny little follicles. There you will see inside the ovaries. So what happens? Let's say, yes, my hypothesis in my brain. Let's just make that my brain. FSH is secreted into the blood because it is a hormone. So there's not one duct going from the brain to the ovary. It is a hormone, so it's secreted into the blood. The target organ is the ovaries. So what happens here if FSH is secreted, a hormone is secreted, it stimulates these follicles to develop. And as soon as these follicles start developing, there you can see, as soon as they start getting ripe, the development of the follicles, as they are getting bigger. So you might have tiny follicle. You don't have to write primary, secondary, but as your follicles get bigger, it enlarges. But as soon as your follicles start um, developing, it secretes the hormone estrogen. So if I ask you, the part of the female reproductive system that secretes estrogen, it's the ovaries, because even this tiniest of follicle, so you will have, as the follicles are getting bigger, you will have an increase in estrogen until you have, yeah, you can see this ripe follicle. There you have a nice big ripe follicle. And that is at its biggest. And what do I call these, the ripe follicle? The graphene follicle. And inside this follicle, you will have your ovum. Right. And then what happens? The hypothesis secretes another hormone. And that hormone is LH, luteinizing hormone. So the first one, follicle stimulating hormone, stimulates the follicles to develop. Once the follicles, as they develop, they secrete estrogen. So estrogen would increase until it reaches a ripe follicle. That's when the maximum estrogen is secreted. In, and this ripe follicle is referred to as a graphene follicle. Inside this follicle, you have the egg cell. Then what happens? The hypothesis secretes the hormone LH. And LH stimulates this follicle to burst open. There you can see it burst open and it releases the egg cell by the process of ovulation. So if you are asked in the exam, name the hormone that stimulates ovulation. It's LH, right? And the process by which an egg cell is released from a ripe follicle, that process is called ovulation. Now you have this empty follicle remaining. So what do you think is going to happen to the estrogen now? Because remember I said here, all these little follicles up until there secretes estrogen. So you have this increase in estrogen. Right Now the egg cell is released, and remember it's released into the fallopian tube. 
And now you have an empty follicle. So now you don't have any more estrogen. So there you can see from day seven, there you can see what happened as my follicle developed, what happened? My level of estrogen increased. So this is my estrogen here that increase. Yeah, I can see as soon as the estrogen, sorry, as soon as the follicle, is, sorry, the egg cell is released, I have an empty follicle. Now I'm going to have a decrease in estrogen. But to prevent that, LH also stimulates the development of the corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum now secretes pro- Progesterone. I know it is a mouthful. Let's go to the next, to the table. Maybe it will become clearer on the table. So, pituitary gland or the hypophysis secretes two hormones. What are the two hormones? FSH and LH. What does FH, FSH do? It stimulates the growth of the follicle. What does LH do? It stimulates ovulation. Also, it stimulates the formation of the Corpus luteum. You can fold that in. Oh, there it is. Right. Now, what does the ovary do? As it, the follicles are developing, sorry, yeah, as the ovaries are developing, it secretes estrogen. And what is the main function of estrogen? The thickening of the endometrium. So if that was my uterus, remember I have the endometrium inside. So what happens? this endometrium becomes thick because every month my body prepares itself for pregnancy. So if that zygote is fertilized, it can implant in this vascular structure. So this endometrium becomes vascular, full of blood vessels. The, the blood vessels becomes full. It is now ready for implantation. That is estrogen. So once my corpus luteum has they, it now secretes progesterone. And what does the progesterone do? It maintains the thickness of the endometrium. So if no fertilization took place, what's going to happen? My progesterone is going to decrease. My, if I go back on this diagram, my corpus luteum degenerates. So you can see if it becomes smaller, meaning progesterone will decrease. I know it becomes very confusing. At this stage, you must know the two hormones secreted by the hypothesis of the pituitary gland, FSH and LH. Make sure you know the function. The hormone secreted by the ovaries is estrogen. The hormone secreted by, uh, sorry, by the corpus luteum, the empty follicle, is progesterone. And then if pregnancy took place, Progesterone is further secreted by the placenta. Right. It will become clearer once we do an example. Right. Here we have a diagram that represents the, if I can just go here, I need my pen again. And this is what you must do once you, when you write exams. Underline what is given. Oh, come now, Michelle. The sequence of events that take place during the ovarian. What does ovarian mean? Inside the ovary. I go find, so there I can see, I've got a tiny follicle. The follicle becomes bigger. Which hormone is been, going to be secreted? Estrogen. More estrogen. More estrogen. More estrogen. The bigger the follicle, the more estrogen. Until I have this big ripe follicle here called my graphian follicle. So if I know what's happening, so that's the follicles. What's going to help that follicle stimulate the development of the follicle? Which hormone? F is H. These follicles are going to secrete which hormone? Estrogen. Right. Then LH comes along and LH causes this follicle to release my egg cell by the process of ovulation. Now, the remaining empty follicle is now called the corpus. And please do not confuse. Every year, learners confuse corpus luteum with corpus callosum. 
which you will do when you do the brain. And this corpus luteum will then secrete progesterone. So let's read our question. We understand our diagram. They just want the name of a hormone. Now remember what did Ms. Fortain say? The hormones involved in the menstrual cycle in the ovary, it's FSH, LH, estrogen. That controls the development of A. Where's A? The development of the follicle, that would be FSH. The process taking place here would be ovulation. Describe the change that takes place in the uterus as the result of the hormone secreted by A. Right? If we go, oh, sorry, why did I bring the answer? It causes the endometrium. Remember, the graphene follicle is now going to secrete estrogen. And what is the change that takes place in the uterus with estrogen? The endometrium, one mark, becomes thick. Or you could say it becomes vascular, second mark. Structure B degenerates. So structure B I've identified as my corpus luteum. If fertilization does not take place, explain the implication for this for the ovarian cycle. So if fertilization does not take place, what's going to happen? The level of progesterone will decrease or drop. Therefore, FSH is no longer inhibited and a new follicle will start to develop. And for the uterine cycle, if the level of progesterone drop, endometrium is not maintained and menstruation takes place. Very, very important, these hormones. So make sure, grade 12, you know what's happening inside the ovary. Make sure you also know what's happening inside the uterus. Right. Now we're going to look at the negative feedback between FSH and progesterone. And according to the exam guideline, you must know this negative feedback. Right. So what happens here, you can see, if the ovum is fertilized, fertilization took place, the ovum was released by which process? Ovulation. Ovum is released in the fallopian tube. Sperm cell come and it fuses with the ovum and what takes place? Fertilization. The corpus luteum remains active. So if you look at the size of the corpus luteum, it indicates to you whether fertilization took place or not. If the corpus luteum remains the same size, meaning fertilization took place, progesterone will keep on being secreted. If the corpus luteum degenerates or becomes smaller, it is an indication that fertilization did not take place. Right. So if your corpus luteum remains the same size or active, it continues to secrete progesterone. This is very important. Now, the increase in progesterone, while there's progesterone in the body or in the blood, it will inhibit. Inhibit means it stops, it prevents the pituitary gland from secreting FSH. And if there's no FSH, what's going to happen? No follicle will develop. And if there's no follicle, what is the consequence? No ovulation. But when the level of progesterone drops, what's going to happen? FSH is no longer inhibited and a new follicle develops. So for your information, grade 12, if I can summarize it. As long as there is an increase in progesterone, it inhibits, meaning it stops the secretion of FSH, but you must know by which gland, by the pituitary gland. It will inhibit the pituitary gland from secreting FSH. So if there's no FSH, there's no follicle developing. If there's no follicle developing, there's no ovulation taking place. And if there's no ovulation, there can be no fertilization. Very, very important. So let's start here. If I must summarize the negative feedback. If I have, and you cannot just say progesterone inhibits, an increase in progesterone 
inhibits. What does inhibit mean? It prevents a gland from carrying out its normal function. So increase in progesterone will prevent the pituitary gland from secreting FSH, meaning you're going to have less FSH. If there's less or no FSH, it will stop follicle development in the ovary. And what's the cause of that? Decrease estrogen. And that will cause the pituitary gland to secrete less LH, which causes no ovulation. Right. This was a question from November 2021. Read the extract below. Now, remember, please read with understanding. They tell us, now, learners lost, you said, but we have not studied endometriosis. They tell you what endometriosis is. It's a medical condition that occurs when the endometrium develops in or on other substances. Now, remember, where do I normally get my endometrium? It is the inner lining of the uterus. But with endometriosis, instead of the endometrium developing Inside the uterus, it either develops inside the fallopian tubes, or on the ovaries, or in the pelvis. And it is very painful because what does it do? It causes high levels, high levels of estrogen, right? Females with this condition will most likely experience severe menstrual pains. This can lead to infertility. Doctors may prescribe a contraceptive pill as treatment to reduce the development of the endometrium. The pill, now what does this pill contain? Progesterone. Now, if you remember what we just said two minutes ago, the structure where the endometrium normally develops, where do I find my endometrium? Inside my uterus. Now, explain why endometriosis in the fallopian tube may lead to infertility. What is endometriosis? It is where the endometrium develops. So if this is my tube, if I can just give, if that's my uterus, and remember, then I have my tubes. Oh, I'm bad at drawing. And here I have my ovaries. So can you imagine if instead of the endometrium here becoming thicker, it, here it becomes very thick. What does it cause here in my fallopian tube? If this becomes very thick, it's going to cause a blockage, meaning once the egg cell is released, either the egg cell cannot move through or it's the space, there's no space for it. It blocks it, it cannot move through. Or if fertilization did take place, meaning the zygote cannot move through. Uh, so let's just, oh, sorry, let me just remove all ink on the side. So how can endometriosis lead to infertility? What does infertility mean? Infertility means you cannot bear children. Right, so let's look. So you're going to have a thick layer cause an obstruction. What does endometrius do? It causes either a blockage or an obstruction. And what's that going to cause? It's going to prevent the passage of gametes, meaning either the sperm cell cannot reach the egg cell or the egg cell cannot reach the sperm cell. So gametes cannot pass through. And if gametes cannot pass through, what cannot take place? fertilization cannot take place. And if there's no fertilization, that it means infertility. Infertility basically means no fertilization. Or you could say it causes an obstruction and the embryo, if fertilization did take place, the embryo cannot reach the uterus. Okay. Use the negative feedback mechanism to explain why pills containing progesterone are successful in treating endometriosis. So if I have drink a pill with progesterone, what's going to happen to the concentration of progesterone? You, it's going to increase. So the high concentration of progesterone, one more, is going to inhibit, remember my negative feedback? What does it inhibit? The pituitary gland from secreting FSH. Right. And if there's no FSH, 
there will be no follicle. And if there's no follicle, there will be no estrogen. And remember, estrogen is the cause of endometriosis. There you can see it is caused by a higher than normal level of estrogen. So you need to keep the level of estrogen low to prevent endometriosis. This was really a higher order thinking question. But it's easy if you know your work. Just ask yourself, what are they asking? Right, let's continue. Fertilization. Now, what is fertilization? Fertilization is when the nucleus of a sperm fuses with the nucleus of an ovum. And what is the product of fertilization? A diploid zygote. Remember, the sperm has 23 chromosomes, haploid. The ovum has 23 chromosomes. So the zygote will have 46 chromosomes, and that is why we call it diploid. So once I have my zygote, what happens? Mitosis takes place. So I've got my zygote. My zygote will develop into a ball of cells called the marula. So I have this ball of cells developing by mitosis. And then that will develop further by mitosis into a hollow ball of cells, meaning there's a hollow in the middle. And then I have this ball of cells with this hollow cavity, and that is my blastocyst. Not blastocyte means A. So your marula and your blastocyte is part of your embryo, and then you will have a fetus. So you must know the development of this. If we go there, remember my ovum is in my ovary. It is released through the process of ovulation. So they have my egg cell. I have my little sperm cell coming. Fertilization takes place. Now I have a zygote. The zygote develops by mitosis into a ball of cells. There I can see still in my fallopian tube as it moves called the marula. The marula, there's the hollow cavity. Hollow ball of cells, my blastocyst, which would take about four days. Blastocyst moves down the fallopian tube into the uterus where implantation takes place. Right. Diagram below shows structures formed during human reproduction. So here I have a ball of cells. Right. Identify parts so I go, I first make sure I understand what is happening on my diagram. Here I have a ball of cells, that is my sperm cell, that would be my acrosome, that would be my nucleus, that would be my mitochondria. The first thing you do when answering a diagram question is identify all the labels. So give name the part A, so I know it's the acrosome. Name the organelle found in large numbers in part C. So I know part C is my middle section or my neck. And which organelle is found there? My mitochondria. Give the number, either one, two, three, or four only, of the diagram that represents the following. Now it's one mark, meaning there's only one. Which diagram represents the marula? It is a ball of cells. Number three, the structure that will implant in the uterus. Number one, my hollow ball of cells, my blastocyte, so sorry, or my blastula also number one. Give the letter and name of the part that will enter the ovum during fertilization. Remember when the sperm cell fuses with the egg cell, which part enters? B, the nucleus. Name the type of cell division that occurred to produce the structure in D. From a zygote, how do I get to my marula? Type of cell division, mitosis. Remember, meiosis is only for gamete formation. Meiosis only takes place inside the testes and inside the ovaries. Right, so there I have my answers. And your answers are on your notes. Please make sure you go through it. Then they could ask you, describe the development of a zygote. So the zygote is already developed. 
until implantation. It is that diagram. If we just go back from the zygote until implantation. So you can say the zygote divides by mitosis one more to form a ball of cells called the merula that forms a hollow ball of cells, third mark, called the blastocyst that will implant. You need to know that. And there we go, zygote by mitosis to form a ball of cells, the marilla, which divide to form a hollow ball of cells, the blastocyst. Right, then very important. I need to emphasize this. So after implantation, you're going to have all these membranes. There you can see there's my blastocyst developing. My, and you will have all these me extra embryonic membranes developing around the embryo. The membrane on the outside is called the chorion. And there you can see it develops finger-like outgrowths called the chorionic villi. And then your embryo is also, the uterus will also develop and these two will embed and form the placenta. So you can see the placenta is the tissue from the mother, from the uterus and tissue from the chorion. There's the chorionic villi. So there I have my placenta. Now, before we get that, a learner's often mistake gestation and pregnancy. Now, when we say a woman is pregnant, pregnancy refers to all the changes that take place in the body of a female as a result of the developing fetus. So once fertilization has taken place, you're going to have hormonal, physical, emotional changes in the female's body. And that period is referred to as pregnancy. Gestation, however, is the period of development. So if I ask you, what is the period of development of the fetus in the uterus from conception to birth? That 40 weeks, are you with me? That is gestation. So if you ask the period of development, you cannot write pregnancy. It is gestation. That's the difference between gestation and pregnancy. So here you have your fetus. You have your placenta, which consists of tissue of the mother and the fetus. Then you have what we call, there you can see the placenta is attached to by the umbilical cord. So there we have the fetus with the umbilical cord, which is a cord that has two blood vessels. And there you can see you have an umbilical vein that goes from the placenta to the fetus. And you have an umbilical artery, two umbilical arteries that goes from the fetus to the placenta. Learners often confuse these two. So please make sure you know what your placenta is. This would be the placenta, the structure in the uterus that nourishes the fetus. And remember, the placenta has many functions. It consists of endometrial and embryonic tissue. It's for gaseous exchange between mother and fetus, meaning oxygen is going to go from the mother to the fetus and carbon dioxide, vice versa. It provides nutrients to the fetus and takes away metabolic waste. And it also, very important, secretes progesterone. So if you're asked in an exam, two places in the female body that secretes progesterone, Remember, your corpus luteum as well as your placenta. Then you have your umbilical cord. Remember, it joins. It's a cord-like structure with two blood vessels that joins the fetus to the placenta. And it has an umbilical artery, two umbilical arteries, and an umbilical vein. Umbilical artery carries carbon dioxide and waste to the placenta, meaning from the fetus to the placenta. The umbilical vein, make sure you know this, carries oxygen and nutrients from the placenta, meaning from the mother to the fetus. And there I have my fetus. The inner membrane is my amnion. Outer membrane is my chorion. And 
in between that, I have my amniotic fluid. And very important, what does the amniotic fluid? It's the fluid inside the amniotic sac. And the function is not just for protection. What does it do? It's a shock absorber. It protects against temperature changes and it protects against drying out. Make sure you know the generic functions of the. Right, let's have a look at this question. Study the diagram below and answer the questions that follow. Now, if I look at the diagram, remember what I said? Try and identify the labels. So if that is my fetus, always start with the fetus. The fetus is joined to the placenta by C, my umbilical cord. So then D must be my placenta. Then A, that must be the fluid inside. So it's my amniotic fluid. And that membrane on the outside must be my chorion. And there I've got my labels. Now I can look at the at the questions. Identify A. Remember, chorion is the outer membrane. So my answer is chorion. Identify B. Because I've identified it, it's the amniotic fluid. Name three functions of the amniotic fluid. You cannot just write protect. Protect against what? It acts as a shock absorber meaning it protects it against all kind of physical or mechanical damage. It prevents drying out of the fetus, or you can say it helps with the moisturizing of the fetus. It has a thermal regulatory function, meaning it protects against temperature changes, and it allows for more free movement of the fetus while it is in the uterus. Oop, apologies for that. Name two substances transported by the artery in structure C. Remember, what is C? My umbilical cord. So, and now they're saying the artery. What is the artery? The umbilical artery. But they're not asking you for the umbilical artery. They want, so if you know two substances, what is the umbilical artery? Remember what I said earlier on? The artery goes from the fetus to the placenta. The umbilical vein goes from the placenta to there. So two substances from there would be your deoxygenated blood, where all the oxygen has been removed, and also your metabolic waste. Going from the here to there would be your oxygenated blood and all your nutrients. What is the function of part D, the placenta? We've, we know it's the placenta. It helps with nutrition. It helps with gases exchange. Waste is carried away against harmful pathogens and chemicals. And it secretes progesterone. So make sure you study the functions of the placenta. This is a typical exam question. The diagram below shows a developing human fetus. Remember what Ms. Fortain said, you first identify the labels. So A here is this tissue here, so it must be my placenta. Is there a B? So this part is my umbilical cord. They've enlarged it. So which one goes to the mother? My umbilical vein. Which one? So, 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 sorry, from the, from the fetus to the mother, my apologies, I made the same mistake as the umbilical artery. And B, from the mother to the fetus would be my umbilical vein. Identify part D, oh sorry, and then my C, which would be my amniotic fluid. And D would be my amniocorion. It is the outer membrane, so it must be the chorion. So if they ask me identify part D, I can just write down chorion. Two functions of the fluid in C, if I didn't know what it was, there's my clue, it's a fluid. The only fluid here is the amniotic fluid. And remember, acts as a shock absorber, it protects it against temperature changes, against drying out and free movement, any two. 
Describe, remember, development of the zygote until implantation. So there's already a zygote. Zygote divides by mitosis, one mark, to form a ball of cell, second mark, called the marula, third mark, that further divides into a hollow ball of cells called the blastocyst. State two ways in which part A, that is now the placenta, functions in protecting. How does it protect the developing fetus? And there we can see it acts as a microfilter. So here we cannot talk about the waste and the nutrients. How does it protect? It's a microfilter. It removes waste. It produces antibodies. And it maintains the endo medium by secreting, obviously, um, progesterone. Identify blood vessel B. Remember, do not make the mistake. It's going from the mother to the fetus, umbilical vein. Fetus to fetus vein. And describe, sorry, describe how the nutrition of a human fetus differs from that of an oviparous um, that is just a question that links to vertebrate reproduction. At this stage, in humans, we receive our nutrients from where? From the mother's blood via the placenta or the umbilical vein. And in oviparous, remember, it's organisms that lay eggs. How do they get their nutrition from the egg yolk? As simple as that. That was just a bit of a higher order question. And now it's time for me to stop talking and for my learners to make sure that they've understood this afternoon's lesson. I'm giving you five minutes to quickly complete our little quiz that's on here, our terminology. All this terminology comes from this afternoon session. So I'm giving you five minutes. It's 23 minutes past. At 28 minutes past, we're going to go through all the answers to make sure you have the correct answers. So you may start. Let's see who can finish first. Right, let's go through this. And you can mark your own work because you want to see whether you have learned. That was the purpose of this afternoon. So that not just active teaching can take place, but active learning as well. So let's go through this afternoon's terminology quiz. The vesicle which contains enzymes found in the head of a sperm. And I've given you that answer being the acrosome. A fluid, so remember, fluid, it's the human embryo, go, embryo against injuries and temperature changes. That was one of our last slides. And what do I call that fluid? The amniotic. Apologies for my handwriting. Yeah, they want a hollow ball of cells formed from the zygote. Now, be very careful. Learn to see from the zygote, and they think the one after the zygote is the marula. But here yeah, they're referring to the hollow ball of cells, so it can only be the blastocyst. The outermost membrane found around the embryo or the fetus, that would be my chorion. Finger-like extensions of the chorion, that would be my chorionic villi. The inner lining of the uterus where implantation occurs, that would be my endometrium. Part of the female reproductive system where fertilization, keyword, occurs, fallopian tube. When the nucleus of the sperm fuses with the nucleus of the ovum, that is fertilization, the hormone responsible for the development of follicles in the ovary, that would be FSH, the period between fertilization and birth when the fetus develops in the womb or the uterus, that's gestation, the hormone responsible for ovulation and the formation of the corpus luteum, that is LH, luteinizing hormone. The production of female gametes through meiosis, oogenesis. 
a hormone produced by the pituitary gland that stimulates milk production in human females, that is prolactin. A, a hormone that stimulates the maturation of sperm, testosterone. And the last one, the male reproductive tube that connects the testes with the urethra, that would be the vas deferens or the sperm duct. So thank you once again to all our learners. 